Okay. Daniel, the, the turbo sound. <laughs> Intoxicating, right? <laughs> it's called Mr. Song. What's going on? How are you? Good. How are you? Thanks for showing up in your, what sounded like a motorcycle, honestly. <laughs> I mean, again, there's a little bit of difference. Yeah. Yeah. Here we are, 2021, one year after I had a chance to see the prototype body kit for this car. What's up guys, Larry Chen here. Welcome to another episode of Hoonigan Autofocus. We got Daniel Song, the builder, who actually, uh, this is your second Turbulence Gray A90 Supra that you've built. Both of them have this awesome headlight thing going on, or no, no headlight thing yeah. going on. Um, but this is special to me because we actually had a chance to feature the very first Varus body kit that's right for the a90 supra in japan at varus when we were out there for tokyo auto salon and the the crazy thing is when we saw it there it wasn't actually a body kit it was just like a handmade thing and i think it probably had a lot of bondo yeah to, to get it to work but it was a one-off piece kit and it was actually the master mold that's right that they made to create this kit. Exactly. And with that said, we couldn't actually shoot the car. We couldn't even drive it because they couldn't move it. It was too fragile. Yeah. So it would fall apart if we tried to move it. But this is the actual kit in the flesh. This is the first time I'm actually seeing one. So tell us about your build and why did you build a second one? So obviously about seven months ago, we got a chance to shoot version one, which was the Pendum Supra. Um, and you know, at that time we were sort of limited by what was available. I mean, I had just taken delivery of one of the first SoCal Supras. We had, between the time of delivery and SEMA 2019, it was roughly about 45 days. 
Um, so you could imagine there wasn't a huge extensive catalog of parts um, to really personalize the build in a way that you would really want. So uh, a lot of it was just kind of using what was available and putting something together that you were happy with. And I, you know, again, based on the reception of the V1 car, I think we did an incredible job with what we had. Um, now, given we're a year later, there's a lot more options and, and choices that you have to personalize the build. So, you know, the old goal of V2, or I just call it V2 for short, is really to build the ultimate Supra that I had originally envisioned. Um, and you're right, funny enough, when I had seen the original Varus concept at Tokyo Auto Salon last year, you know, I saw a few photos and it was actually your video on autofocus that got a chance for me to actually see the car because you were walking around the vehicle and it really wasn't static shots that really confirmed that this is the kit that I wanted. Um, and of course, the original kit you saw was again, like you said, the clay model. Um, and during the whole pandemic, because I think you shot that before coronavirus really shut everything down, right? Because that was early January. And so when the pandemic all hit, I think everything had kind of ceased operations for a little bit. I think Varus wasn't actually taking the kit and making it just yet. Um, and then beyond that, the announcements that SEMA was going to get canceled for 2020, um, the urgency to develop the production version of this kit wasn't there for obvious reasons. Um, but we had a great opportunity to unveil this car at the Toyo Tread Pass virtual experience. And so we had to literally contact Varus and say, no, we still need this kit. And so we have the very first production kit um, on this car. And this is, as of right now, the only Supreme kit in the world outside of the, the Varus personal demo car right now. So this, that's what it's called. It's the, the Supreme A90. Yeah, Supreme 90. Okay, Supreme 90, all right. There's so much to say. I have so much to talk about. Just a little bit of history. So the version one was the first car that we actually had a chance to shoot of yours. Yeah. And then we shot your 240Z. Combined, you know, those almost have a million views, right? So I'm not saying that this is something where it has to top the previous one, sure. but it has because of the fact that you mentioned in the previous video how much of a crunch it was to build the first one. Parts just weren't available and yep. you guys were doing everything you possibly could just to get it on the show floor. Exactly. Even to the point where you were doing last minute touches like the day of, right? Yep. Um, but like you said, this one, a lot more time and you actually fell in love with the car and that's why you wanted to build the version two. Absolutely, so again, there was, I think when the A90 first came out, you saw a lot of the big YouTubers pick up Supras just to kind of have that new flavor of the month for their channel. But, you know, I genuinely love this car. You know what I mean? Again, like I said, it isn't, I can't, I don't think it has the same romantic attachment and the nostalgic attachment that we do with the Mark IV Supras, but I judge each car for its, as its own standalone platform. And I think for what it is, and, and inside of this one year since we last filmed, I mean, like, look at how much the B58 has proven itself as an incredible platform. Uh, people are doing incredible drag times. People are breaking a thousand horsepower. People are competing with the vehicle. Um, I mean, there's just a lot going on that I think this Supra is making its own mark. And so I genuinely love the vehicle. That's the reason why I built two of them. Um, and this is, again, like I said, the, the ultimate expression of what I wanted to achieve. Yeah, for example, um, we had all year to follow um, Steph Papadakis yeah. and, and Frederick Osbo in his A90 Supra, which I just couldn't believe how much of the stock parts they actually used yeah. on the vehicle, including uh, the stock bottom end. Um, and, and there's just so many things that Steph actually explained to me in his video series while he was shooting his video series uh, what it's allowed him to do for it to have, for him to have a modern sports car and a modern engine versus something like a RB26 or um, 2J, something that's old school that's had a lot of time for development. Yeah. Essentially what he has now is he has a blank canvas that's kind of like with new technology that's allowed him to create this thing that's pretty amazing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so let's kind of go over some of the things. Let's start on the outside. There's just so much. Okay, so I remember one of the things that you had an issue with originally in version one was how the paint had to be sprayed on. Yeah. Did you transfer over what you learned to this? So funny enough, and again, this is stuff that I learned in the process, which again, I feel like there's always a learning curve and there's always something you should be learning from every one of your builds. 
Um, the last build, we the turbulence gray was a brand new color. There, the, the, the formulas weren't even in the system for it. Uh, ironically enough, it is actually a BMW color renamed. And so we were able to get something close, but the body shop had to do almost 20 spray outs to get it to an exact match on the version one car. Um, because we had painted the kit, we realized that it was off in certain lights. So we went back and repainted the car literally two weeks before SEMA. Um, of course, we have the formula now, so I brought back the same color car and I assumed that formula would work. We sprayed it out and sure enough, it was still mismatched. So even though it's the same car, same color, there are subtle variances based on when the car is actually produced, right? I mean, all these things like humidity, temperature, pigment, when the batch was made, all that makes subtle variations that we don't realize as just everyday consumers. And so even though we had a formula in the system from the last year car, we had to do an additional, I think 16 or 18 spray outs to get again a match. But one thing I'm happy to say is that again, like I said, we didn't settle till we got a hundred percent match on this paint. Well, so why, and this might be a stupid question, but why didn't you just spray the whole car with a new kind of paint color, you know? So the one, the one ace up our sleeve or the one thing that we had planned for the car that we didn't get done for the Toyo Tread Pass event was to actually do a full respray on the car. We were going to actually do a complete color change. Um, but like I said, we were waiting. I mean, it, the car was interesting this year because we got every other area tackled on the build, but we were essentially waiting for the Varus kit to show up. And, you know, there were delays, there were other issues. We had to overnight this package from Japan. Um, and by the time the kit landed, we, you know, it was a decision between myself, my buddy Tuan, who did the body work and the painter saying like, we just don't have enough time to do a proper full respray. So we ditched the idea to do a full respray. And again, hopefully sooner than later, we can do a, a nice full color change on this car eventually. I mean, but realistically, there's just not many panels on here that um, shows the original body. Oh. Like for example, this is the door, um, just this roof area going onto the rear quarter. What else is there? The hood is new. Yeah, the hood. Right. So again, unlike the version one car, you're right. I mean, essentially the door um, and then the rear seat pillar and some of the roof trim is it. Because again, we removed the full steel roof to replace it with a carbon over. I mean, it's not even overlay. It's a full carbon roof replacement. So that panel is gone. Um, and the hood is all carbon fiber. So that the, again, the stock hood is gone too. So essentially about 85, 90% of this car was sprayed with fresh paint. So again, we're close, but again, the details that people don't notice with full color changes, you want to make sure you're doing the door jams, the trunk jams, all the little areas. And that takes a lot of time to di disassemble the car properly to be able to do a full color change. Yeah. And part of it is that because, um, you're honest with your builds in that this is a street car. You know, you're not trying to go race or anything. It's a street car. Um, it of course has the performance aspect of it. It sounds absolutely amazing. It's probably the craziest, <laughs> one of the craziest uh, non-race car sounding A90 Supras I've ever heard. Um, but with that said, you know, that's why you need the engine bay. You need the door jams. You need all those things to be finished mm -hmm. because uh, you will be judged on that kind of Absolutely. stuff. So let's go over the kit itself. Yeah. Um, what are the pieces from the kit? And I already noticed that there, it seems like there are some differences, right? Versus the prototype. Yeah, there are subtle differences. Um, the biggest one, of course, like I said, is um, the number of pieces that this kit comes with versus the Pandem kit. The Pandem kit, uh, off the top of my head, maybe had 11 pieces. This was pushing almost 26 pieces. So when we unboxed it in my garage, it was quite intimidating seeing how many pieces was really involved. But you know, one of the biggest notable differences between the demo car and this car is that you'll see the exposed hardware, the rivets. Um, and, and, and again, that's a production thing because again, in their, in their demo car and the photos that you see of their car, that was a clay model. They just vinyl wrapped over it. And so they didn't have to actually put the hardware on. And I believe even on their current demo car, which now they have the production kit, it's just, it, they're using panel bonding adhesive or double stick tape to just tape it on. It's not using any physical hardware. So in a case where I'm actually driving my car, you know, in a spirited fashion, we did a runway um, recording where I was out there pushing the car about 120, 130 miles an hour down a runway. 
panels would start flying off the car if it was just using adhesive. So we had to use obviously hardware and there was no way around that. And I didn't even realize that until the car, act, the kit actually showed up that we had to use hardware. It was the first time I realized it too. It actually does look good. It fits the look of your build. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's kind of one of those things where it potentially could be something that has been played out. But the way that this kit is modeled, the way it lays out, it's like the whole side of the car and yeah. it, in a way it becomes part of the design and it's actually kind of cool. Yeah, so we shaved off a few, actually some of the rivet points or some of the parts where the Allen bolts would go, we actually shaved off and, and, and deleted a few of them that we felt like structurally wasn't like important. Um, and it again, because for every point where there's a piece of hardware, it does create a little bit of a visual distraction or break in the line. So we did actually eliminate just maybe three or four that we felt like wasn't necessary to the integrity of the structure. Um, and that just minimizes how many distractions there are. And it was also, I mean, little things like, for example, choosing the proportionate button heads towards the indentation of the kit is also really important because, you know, you have a lot of people that are doing these like Liberty Walk or like Pandem kits or various kits. And they're using all these very like oversized button heads, which again, it's, it's a subjective thing. But for me, like when the button heads are so big and you know, they're contrast colors, like let's say titanium or they're black, it again, you create visual distraction. And so for me, again, on the silver body, obviously I went with silver stainless hardware and I went with the smallest hardware I could, again, so that it fit well within the indentations um, without creating distractions. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. Okay. Yeah. so. The hood, obviously, that's the biggest piece that yeah. comes. Um, and uh, it's this piece right here that's the special part of the Supra is the fact that the hood is part of the fender. Yep. Um, let's see, what other pieces are there that comes from, from Vera? So, so the full front carbon front splitter, um, which is very interesting because in the photos, it looks like it'd be two pieces, but it's actually one piece. Um, but the way it's designed, it kind of has a sort of like sidestep to it. Um, the front canard is also Varus. Um, the front fender, again, like you said, is the front cap, the hood cap, and then this rear, this secondary piece, which is, you know, it's really interesting because again, like I said, you have one, two, three, four pieces that make up just the rocker panel. You know what I mean? Wow. And it's, it, I'm, this design element is so cool. Yeah. I just can't believe, like when I first saw this car, I was thinking to myself, I was like, how are these body kit manufacturer is going to use this, utilize this area, yeah. you know? How are they gonna split it up? Yeah. But this is such a great way to see it. And also, honestly, I really have to hand it to the Japanese guys, like us actually being able to tour Veras, go into where they actually make yeah. the products by hand, <laughs> no machines. Yep. You know, I mean, they use the stuff for sanding or whatever, but they don't have like a big production line. Oh. It's just hand built and everything is just like hand signed off, hand inspected by Japanese craftsmen, legitimately. It's it's true artisanship at work. You know what I mean? Look, it takes nothing away from the modern builders. You know, I mean, again, like I said, on one side you have Mirasan who does these amazing rapid prototypes. I mean, he's he's got a kit out for a car that's not even physically production available yet. You know what I mean? So he's using, you know, CNC routers. He's using 3D CAD designs and 3D scans. And then you got Varus guys on the other hand, <laughs> literally doing clay models and it's beautiful the work that they do and so you know putting this kit together there are very very subtle asymmetrical issues meaning if you're OCD you know it's a little off but you got to appreciate the fact that this is done by hand not a computer it didn't it wasn't mirrored it's some guy sat here shaving and carving and sculpting all of this and so the subtle variance I guess just lends itself to that artisanal quality yeah I, I and then while we were there we did have a chance to see a car in the back that had clay added on top of it, yeah. you know? And, and it was like the next, whatever next kit that they were making. And that's how they actually get to see the kit in real life, just come to shape yeah. versus making everything in a computer like what yeah. Mirasan does. Um, so uh, what other pieces like the roof is not made by Varus. No, so the roof is actually provided by RKP Composites through IND Distributions. Um, so again, like I said, there's there's a few ways you can do it. Obviously, a lot of street builders and, and, and enthusiasts will just do a simple vinyl overlay, right? Because it, it does the job of providing the contrast panel. Then the second stage to that would be to do a, a, a veneer or an overlay, right? Where you're buying a thin sheet of carbon and laying, laying it over your steel or aluminum roof. In this case, this is an actual panel replacement, which, you know, 
beyond the visual appeal of a carbon roof, it's functional. You, I shaved 18 pounds off the, the weight of the car by drilling out all the, the factory weld points, peeling back the actual uh, aluminum roof, chucking that, and then bonding in this new carbon roof. So it's, it was a really invasive process. It, it felt like open heart surgery. Well, that's incredible because First of all, for a moment, you had a like a, a, a speedster or like a convertible A90, right? Yeah. But um, this, you want to talk about premium? Like this is where it's at. Like yeah. that, that is so premium, and it's kind of um, you have to have something like that to go along with the rest of the car. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the rear. Yeah. So uh, again, you have the rear over fender from Varus. You have the carbon spat, the rear pieces here, and then the full under tray diffuser. Because again, even on the version one car, there was nothing in the rear other than the rear fender on the Pandem kit. They never tackled the diffuser. And so this is a full diffuser. Um, obviously makes it much more difficult to drive because you're not only avoiding the front, but you also have to watch out for these diffuser strikes getting stabbed into stuff. Oh, I, I love the subtle things that you've done, including gold. Um, it's a gold shielding. Yeah, inside. like a thermal repellent. So because the the, un, the the diffuser sits right underneath the exhaust, it's trapping obviously a lot of heat. And so the carbon resin is going to take on a lot of heat, which I think it's pretty resilient as it is. Um, but just to give it that extra measure of safety, I did layer the inside of the diffuser with that gold reflective tape. Mm. I love the way that this actually interacts with the stock um, portion of this. This is or honestly for a stock car to have this kind of piece is is pretty funky honestly it's impossible for me to clean mine you know because it's like dirt and stuff gets stuck in here yeah. but the fact that this is um in a way extended and it's also um just just i guess they went off of the design yeah. and kind of uh extended this line yeah. or this feature it's it's really cool and it's it's very tasteful. It is. And that's what I think I love most about the Varus kit is the fact that they play with both the positive spaces, but also the negative spaces, right? The fact that that side spat floats away from the main body. The fact that the side strakes or the skirts float away from the body. So again, the negative spaces are just as interesting as the actual kit itself. And then tell me about the exhaust, because seriously, when you were pulling up here, I thought I was like, oh, somebody's riding their motorcycle up here. It's so high pitched. Yeah. and it sounds incredible. Last on the version one car, we ran the, the stainless steel system from Remark. Um, at SEMA last year, at 2019, I had talked to uh, the owner and said, hey, you know, do you guys ever plan on doing titanium? And they're like, no, you know, we're, you know, there's a few other players that are doing it where we just don't see the need to do it. And I, you know, again, like I said, I could have sourced another titanium exhaust, but I kept going back and saying, hey, come, can we do something? Can we do something special? Because again, it wasn't just about picking cool parts, but also like unique things that wasn't done before. And so Remark had agreed on the V2 build to do a one-off full titanium spec exhaust. So this was are indeed off the car, off my car back in Irvine uh, probably earlier this year. And then again, this was the first uh, full titanium spec Remark exhaust, which lends itself to the unique sound over a stainless exhaust. Oh, wow. Um, this is Varus too. Yep. Really nice premium. Yep. They're full uh, GT wing. Tell me about the wheels and brakes. Wow. These brakes are serious. Yeah. So like the first version one car, we're running Brembo's. Uh, these are the GTS calipers and type three rotors. Um, but unlike the first car, we didn't just go with the front rotors and calipers. We actually did a matching rear set as well. Um, and again, that just wasn't available at the time last year in 2019. In 2020, it was an option. So we did front and rear. Um, I had my buddy Tuan who again helped with the body work. He did the custom painting. We removed all the enamel off the Brembo logo and using a syringe and careful masking, we, we dropped in the acid green detail into it. Um, and it's a fun, again, we, fun little details, you know what I mean? So, yeah, no, that, that actually resets it off. I'm sure you definitely needed the syringe for that little arrow. Yeah. So, <laughs> I love that the arrow points to where it should be going, <laughs> you know, the direction of the braking. We get to avoid technical installation errors, you know what I mean? So yeah, front and rear Brembo GTS brakes, um, it eliminates the park brake, but again, like I said, it, for what I'm using it for, it's not necessary. Um, but again, it's, it's just a, an amazing, amazing setup and it's quite, you know, performance oriented, obviously. Huh. 
Um, tell me about the wheel and tire combo. Yeah, so we're running obviously Toyo R888Rs. Um, and again, these are the monoblock TS5 wheels from Titan 7. Uh, these are not the final wheels for the car. So obviously, um, if you look at Dai Yoshihara Evasive's uh, Pikes Peak FRS and a few other cars, uh, they have a race program multi-piece wheel. And again, like I said, most notably on Dai's car. Um, and so Titan 7 had agreed to building a custom spec wheel for this application. So we have um, all the specs dialed in, we had it made, uh, you know, ready to go. But again, because of COVID delays, the wheels just aren't here in time. They literally are set to arrive any day now. And, and I know we were holding off on shooting this for the wheels, but these are the monoblock wheels. These are what's available for the A90 Super, which I think they look great anyways, because last car I did was a monoblock wheel too, because it's it lends itself to that motorsports theme. But the new wheels that will be coming is similar finish, the same profile design, but it'll have the multi-piece with the lip on it. So it will allow me to eliminate the use of spacers altogether. But also, I'm sure you can go way wider tire wise. I can. So um, we have some massive beefy Toyo tires waiting in the garage. Um, the wheel is going to be a 19 by 13 square setup. What? It's insane. Square? Yeah. Wait, 19. so then what are you going to put in the rear? 325s or something? I don't know the specs off the top of my head, but they are massive. They look like Lamborghini Murcielago rear tires sitting in the garage. I well, mean, because a lot of people don't realize this, but this A90 Supra in stock body form fits 305s comfortably, yep. you know? And yep. that's what I'm running on my car. I'm running 305s in the rear yep. and 275s in the front. Yep. Stock body, yep. you know, and it's fine. I'm sure you can probably even run, well, with the wide body, I'm sure you can run some serious yeah. meat back there. Yeah. And it needs it for, with how much power this is making, I'm yeah. sure. I also like this design too, that they're not trying to fake anything yeah. in that, yeah, there's, you know, on the stock body, there is that the fake vent yeah, here. Yeah, the Vesh vent there. But this, it, it's, it's, again, it's uh, really bringing the same design element out more. Mm -hmm. And I really like that, I think. And I like the fact that they included a carbon veneer to put there, you know what I mean? They didn't need to do that. It's just an extra touch. I mean, when that piece showed up, I didn't even know what it was. It was such a thin piece of carbon with a curve to it. I had to message the owner of Aris and I said, um, where does this go? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he showed me that it goes in the vents and I was like, oh, that's so amazing. The, these little things about the details, you know what I mean? Um, that I really appreciate about this kit. All right, let's move on to the engine bay. All right, so this actually looks so much more finished than version one, and rightfully so, yeah. as, as we keep saying, you know, oh, rightfully so because of the fact that you just didn't have time. So yeah. tell us a little bit about the motor upgrades here. So the significant difference in this setup is the choice of turbo. Um, last time we went with a Pure 700, which was again, a great, great solution for stock location, great power. People are setting incredible records with the Pure setup. Um, I had a unique opportunity to work with AMS Performance out of Chicago. Um, they provided me with a second prototype kit. The first kit is running on Jackie Ding's car. Uh, so this was kind of like, I jokingly call this the Jackie Ding spec turbo kit because it is relatively in the stock location. Um, but again, obviously a bigger turbo, more power, but his request was obviously as a time attacker, he needs linear power with low end power to come out of the corners pretty quickly. Um, whereas a lot of these top mount turbos are making bigger numbers, um, but at the expense of less torque and less low end power. And so it is a, a, a sort of function purpose designed turbo kit because obviously when you look at AMS's portfolio, they're not afraid of big power. I mean, they're putting out some incredible four digit numbers on Huracans, R8s, GTRs. So this isn't a, this isn't a, like a question as to, well, why couldn't AMS do something with more power? It's more so this was designed specifically for Jackie's needs. And I felt like for me as a, not obviously not as a race car driver, but as a, enthusiast as a street driver this is the turbo setup i would need you know what i mean and so it's amazing it's you know uh, got the heat shielding on it it's a garrett based turbo um and again that's probably the biggest difference which obviously it's all being fed in through this eventuri carbon headlight duct so the air goes straight into the headlight right into the filter on the ams unit um so the and no one can question jackie's either you know yeah. he's a great driver and he has um records yeah. uh, that that um, 
it, it's kind of amazing that he's able to break these records in the Supra that is actually it has so many stock parts you know including stock transmission and all of the electronic nannies that he kind of showed me that he had to basically tuck away to keep the car happy you know yeah. because it is a new car and there's just so many things that it's it's essentially trying to keep you safe it is but it that that doesn't mean that it's fast yeah you know so um he's able to do all of this stuff on on a car that's realistically so stock compared to a lot of other time attack cars in his class and uh I, I just love the fit and finish of this kit and this is really cool too so apr made this huh? yeah we went with a custom satin finish throughout the engine bay on all the carbon details so last year we had the glossy carbon from eventuri so we went with a custom satin finish on the headlight duct on the engine cover um, that's the ams fuse cover and then this was the last piece that i really wanted for the engine bay which was from apr and the reason why i love it is it's not a direct replica of the stock radiator shield it, they actually smoothed it out so there's in the, if you look at the stock one there's extrusions in the aluminum piece and this one is all made simple and so it looks really nice and again i just feel like it frames in the engine you know again i we get that the engine is for performance but it doesn't mean it has to look bad and so in in an engine bay like this i felt like this piece just frames in the b58 so perfectly well you've done so much on the outside to make this look wild you know yeah. might as well dress up the engine bay too exactly. including um these aluminum caps uh, yeah. the, the, it's just a small touch but and it's a small splash of color yeah. but it really adds so much to the engine bay including this cover what is this that's the ecu cover so under that piece right there is where you would remove the stock ecu so yeah it's a it's a it's a really nice piece it's again otherwise it would have been just a black plastic panel piece and again i felt like it it added to the completion of the engine bay hmm. And this uh, Cusco um, brace kind of yeah. ties it in together yep. too. And it was uh, obviously powder coated to match the acid green highlight theme that's going throughout the car. Cool, let's check out the inside. Oh man. Okay, the interior. You have a, a really crazy choice of seats again. <laughs> are, are these the same seats? Yeah, so these are the same Recaro fiberglass seats, the FRP seats. Um, same one you saw in version one. The big difference is I added the visual element of the pinstripe to, to kind of go with the rest of the livery theme. New Knight Runner Willens harnesses uh, this time around. Roll cage from Studio RSR, including the rear brace. Um, this is their version two cage, which allows for more reclining position in a stock seat configuration. Obviously with the bucket seats, it really doesn't matter, um, but this is their newest design for the seats. So is it even harder to get back there now? <laughs> no, the difficulty in the hatch is still probably the same. The biggest benefit in this new design, again, is for the people that have the OEM seats, it allows them to be able to recline the seats a little further back than the first version of their cage. Got it. Got um, it. And then, again, it's, it's all about the little details. You know what I mean? Like when it comes to, for example, um, we have a new push button start from Golden Wrench, which I thought is, is a nice little piece. Um, and then in this area, we have carbon fiber paddles from IND. And I asked my friends over at IND because they do a lot of one-off requests with paint. I said, can you paint the indicators in acid green? And so the plus and minus are painted custom acid green for me. Um, this steering wheel is from Unleashed Customs where they again, once again, did a custom acid green stitching for me. This was a spec that I had requested for Alcantara on the acid green. And again, just, I didn't know how this was gonna all work until it came together. And again, I feel like it, 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 it's subtle where it's not super, again, over the top, but enough to just say, wow, that's a, you know what I mean? A, a, a nice personalized tip. How do they make this wheel? Do, you, do they have to take the stock steering wheel? So yeah, I mean, obviously they probably have a supply, I assume, of core steering wheels, and then they basically rewrap them in carbon and, and, and do what they need to do to, to build up. Because again, the thickness of the steering wheel, the grips are a little bit thicker than OEM. Then obviously in this resin piece, they make this spot for the RPM or shift indicator to go in here. You know what I mean? So does that stuff work right Yeah. Now? What? How does it, how does it have that information though? So this is based on a Bluetooth module. So there is a Bluetooth module plugged into the OBD2 port. And so all the readings from that module get sent to the steering wheel. So when I basically fire up the car, it'll read all the vital information like RPM, miles per hour and other vitals. That's so smart. I can't. I can't even begin to, that is so smart. I, I love that they're using technology. Uh, I mean, like this is like obviously a, a, a 
like a thing that they borrowed from F1 or it was inspired by F1 steering wheels. But I love that they're using technology where as like if Bluetooth wasn't a thing, you couldn't do that before. Yeah, yeah. And again, like I said, they, they thought it all the way through where basically the Bluetooth module, the harness that, that it clips into has a secondary port so you can still plug in diagnostic tools. So you still have access to your OBD2 port, but you also have the Bluetooth module in here too as well. Huh, okay. That is incredible. Okay, so did you have a chance to dyno this or did AMS guys dyno this? So we did get a chance to dyno this because one, once the turbo was on, we needed this car to be still drivable in California. Um, and so we did do it on a 91 octane tune and we're reaching just shy of 500. We're at upper 400s, if I remember correctly, 483. Um, the kit is capable of a lot more. I mean, obviously you look at Jackie's car, same hardware but he has obviously choices between race fuel and 93 octane. So really what we're limited by, and this is really the problem for all A90 owners is really the support fueling mods, right? Whether you're running um, different injectors again, and there are people that are now developing intake manifolds. So those things will give us the ability to tap into a lot more power. And again, being in California where 91 is the most sort of relevant or available fuel again we're kind of limited to what we have here but it's a much more capable than that. well d don't discount yourself because legitimately 500 is uh, it, it's got to be too much for this car already i mean because with with my car i just have a tune um intake you know suspension and bigger tires all the way up to 305 and i still have trouble uh putting power to the ground because it is a rear wheel drive platform yeah uh but it sends all the power back there at the right time yep. because of the transmission. It's so smart it is. and uh, you're always in the power band. Yeah, and it's good. It's again, like I said, between the choice of turbo, the size of the turbo, again, we're talking about, again, when we're talking about power band is again, it's that fun power. And that's the best way I can describe it because sometimes people get fixated on a number and they're like, oh, well, that's 485. I have a friend that has 700 or 800. But how much of that is usable in the way that you're going to do it, right? Because it's like, how much, what percentage of the time is your car living on a, a drag strip versus just driving down the road? And, you know, where this power is at, and, you know, I was out in the Malibu Canyons last week in this car. I, I had so much fun driving this car. It's enough to make it fun and slightly terrifying, but in a usable way. Great, I like that. Okay, so it looks like it's about to rain. <laughs> it doesn't rain in LA often, but as you could probably tell, uh, the storm is coming in legitimately. And um, we can't actually go for a drive or a full shoot right now, but as soon as the weather is a little better, um, I think we should go for a full shoot. As you could see, it's already wet. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, it, this is crazy. This, this is, crazy. is it's icy cold right now and it's windy and- Icy cold for LA, okay? I know it. The rest of the world, it's <laughs> it's a lot colder. But for, for us, if it's not 72 degrees, then we get upset. Um, but with that said, dude, thank you so much for bringing it out. We're, next time, we're gonna uh, drive it. Yeah. Um, and it's basically just gonna jump cut to me going like this. And then it's like, all right, now we're driving it. Uh, <laughs> Looking but, forward to it. Yeah, thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you as always, Larry. Mr. Song. Yep. All right, so we're back. It went like this, went. <laughs> and then now, now the weather is a lot better. Yes. The sun's out. Yep. And then now we're back. I'm gonna finish up the photo shoot and we're also gonna drive it right now. Yeah. I, I just wanna see, see, I brought mine today. Nice. It's that one right there. It's always there. good to see your car. Yeah. Always good. It's, it's not as modded. <laughs> by far it's not as modded but it still has the same sole this one way more modded yeah way cooler looking thank you appreciate um, that all right so let's drive this thing okay you want to go for a drive okay you don't have to ask me <laughs> twice oh my god this seat is crazy so yeah you probably it's probably easier just to use the factory belts do you use the factory belts when you're driving around i do just because it's such a pain in the butt. Okay. Oh, all right. So right away, I noticed a couple things. I can't believe it says the RPM over here. It does. So that's a, that's a rev shift light indicator. So if you give it a couple revs, you'll see the lights come up. Um, and basically, it'll track your RPM indicator. And you can shift 
based on whatever you set it. So you can set the set, set points wherever you want to. Wow. Um, and it's communicating through a Bluetooth module that's plugged into the OBD ports. And it even says miles per hour here. Yeah, and you can show whatever display what you want it to read on the steering wheel for just vital metrics and stuff like that. So does this, the sport mode button still do, do anything? Uh, I mean, it technically not as of right now because one, you're you have the fact that the suspension is not connected to the you know the controller, so the dampening is set by the KW is not necessarily controlled by the car, and then as it pertains to the exhaust noise, this one-off titanium exhaust is valveless, so there's no valve to shut it off. Got so it. there's really not much that it's doing when you turn on the sport mode or not. Okay. Daniel, the, the turbo sound. <laughs> Intoxicating, right? The whistling. Come on. I'm going 30 miles an hour, and the whistling is out of control. Come on, like the, the teenage boy in you is going, yes. <laughs> I'm, li I'm, I'm not even breaking the speed limit, and it sounds amazing. <laughs> How's that even a thing? I don't know. You know, again, like I said, in the first V1 car, we ran the Pure 700. And audibly, there was not much difference from the stock turbo. Yeah. But this Garrett turbo system truly adds a unique driving experience. Come on. <laughs> no way! Yep. That's actually, th that's actually so much more fun for me, I feel like. Yeah. Like the fact that you can floor it at a lower RPM. Yeah. And it's making all that noise. Yeah. Like, the thing about the Supra, a lot of people don't really understand with this car is that the transmission is so smart. Yes. It always keeps it in the power band. Yep. You know, because it is um, a eight speed, yep. it, it can keep it in the power band and you're always just in boost. Yep. When, yep. Especially when you're on track. Yep. Um, but wow, <laughs> it's pretty cool that it makes such a crazy sound in lower RPMs now. And the cool thing about this turbo is, again, like I said, the, the overall output numbers may not be super high, but remember, this was like purpose built, right? We're not intentionally going with an oversized turbo just for drag power and quarter mile times. This was designed in conjunction with Jackie Ding for a, 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 a system that would really give him a lot of power out of corners and out of hairpins and stuff like that, right? It's because it's, it's what he needs. And to me, being obviously a spirited street driver, that's the kind of power that you can enjoy on a street. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, also, these shifters are really nice. Yep. So this, uh, it's, is it just attached to the stock location? Or so how does yeah, this work? So basically you would have to pull off the steering wheel. You unmount the factory one. So there, I mean, there are some, there are some paddle extensions that are simply like double stick tape to the factory ones. These guys are a complete replacement and it extends the paddles by twice the length. So you have so much more coverage to be able to grab and shift even when you're basically um, making tight turns. You know what I mean? Got it, okay. I don't even, I'm speechless. <laughs> it, it's, it's not even the same car. I mean, I drive my Supra every day. Yeah. And it's already fast. Yeah. Th this is not even, it's not even the same car. And this, I mean, you've, you've essentially made this like a, a supercar. And, and this is just at the beginning of what this kit can do. Right, we're only tuned at 91 octane right now, and this is what you're getting. Imagine doing it to 93 or adding like other fuel mods to support this. You're gonna, this is just at the bottom end of the potential of what this kit can do, right? Yeah, and also on top of that, you could fit way bigger tires, yeah, because even with 305s on my car, yeah, and it just has a VF tune uh -huh. and the AM intake it still has some trouble keeping down the power. Yeah. So with this, I feel like you could fit a way wider tire. Absolutely. And then you could just get on the gas away earlier, especially Absolutely. out of corners. Absolutely. Incredible. It's, it's just that whistle. It's so defined. It's unlike... I've driven a couple of these and it, it just... And right when you let off too, you know what I mean? Uh... You know, I try to explain to a lot of people that, you know, when you talk about the driver experience, right? Mm -hmm. The driver experience isn't just horsepower. It isn't just torque. 
its vibrations, its smells, its noises. It's like, how many of the different senses does it really tickle? And that all combined creates the driver experience. Yeah. And like you said, even in lower speed limits, when you're at 20 and 30, just hearing that, hearing that turbo spool, you can't help but add, that doesn't, you can't ignore that that doesn't add to the driver experience to some yeah, level yeah yeah so again i it just makes me smile too uh plus the seats are really comfortable yeah. i don't remember driving or i i don't really remember how it was in your version one uh-huh but um from what you're saying with this it actually has a, lot, a little more room yeah got it Incredible. Um, all right, that's it. Version two, Daniel Song's A90 Supra Turbulence Gray. It's uh, it's definitely a game changer. It, it does feel, or it, it kind of gives me the essence of what Jackie Ding's car would be if it were a street car. Yeah. And I kind of see that that's what you've done. I can't wait to see what you're gonna build next. I think you're gonna you're gonna build some very interesting things that we're going to love to feature on Hoonigan Autofocus. And as always, we appreciate you coming on the show. Um, yeah, thank you so much. No, thank you for always having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Perfect.